Step down into dark Open my All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to our Revelation seminar, Discovering Revelation. I want to welcome all of you who are here on this beautiful Friday. Can you believe it's Friday already? Wow. Where, where has the week gone? Um, it has been uh, a week, and we have been here. Uh, we had our guest speaker this past Wednesday, um, Hayward Penny. Did you all enjoy him? He was, he was very, very uh, uh, powerful in his preaching and grateful that he was here to share. And those online, we want to welcome you all back here uh, to Orange Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, we've been here now 10 nights. Tonight is number 11. Is that correct? Night number 11. Wow. So we have a very important topic to discuss today. And we just want to remind you of where we are. We have been discussing um, a lot of topics, and today we'll be looking at coming of the lawless one. Very, very powerful topic. It's a major theme um, in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation uh, is the center. The center of it is chapters 12, 13, and 14. Remember, in, in, in the Hebraic thought, the main point is in the middle, and in Greek thought, they have their little three points. You know, you have point one, two, and three, and we use that even today in sermons and thoughts and ideas. You have three points. Um, that's very uh, uh, Greek-oriented, and they have the biggest em emphasis at the end. They have the finale, but in Hebraic thought, the main point is not at the end, it's in the middle. And so the book of Revelation is written with the main point in the middle, so we've been looking at Revelation 12, 13, and 14, and today we're looking a little bit at that chapter 13 point. Um, and then Saturday, we're going to be discussing Revelation sign of God. Uh, Hayward shared a, a, a little bit about this this past um, Wednesday, and it's distinguishing God's people on the final crisis uh, when all is said and done. And then on Monday, um, on October 9th, we're going to be looking at Revelation's forgotten history. We're going to be looking at where people actually think a certain thing is in the scriptures and it's not. I've actually heard of many sayings that people say is in the scripture and it's not. And we're going to be looking at one of the biggest ones. So that's on Monday, um, October 9th. Then we're going to discuss... On Wednesday, October 11th, a river runs through it, and it looks at the river that is inside the book of Genesis that also is addressed in the book of Revelation, as if to say we're reading the whole book of the Bible to understand the big, big picture. And then Friday the 13th, October the 13th, Friday, we're going to be looking at the big, difficult, scary topic of Babylon rising. This is what people think about when they hear the book of Revelation, and it terrifies people. And I assure you, when we're talking about Jesus, which is what the book of Revelation is about, we have nothing to fear. Can I get an amen? 
Amen. Because there is nothing to fear as long as Jesus is with us. And we're going to look at some simple keys to understand that. Then next weekend, October 14th, we're going to be looking at Revelation's keys to death. What happens one minute after you die? What happens to us? What does the scriptures really say? And as we're getting through towards the end of the seminar at this point, we're going to be looking at a very powerful question, practical question that a lot of people ask, and it's about this topic of prayer. What does it mean to have God answer our prayers? And what does the scripture say that we can do to actually have those prayers answered. Some people say, wait, can you force God's hand? Can you force this? Well, as we're looking at the book of Revelation, we're reading how we could allow God to speak to us. And as we live according to what he has put before us, could it be also that we could put ourselves in God's will to help some of these prayers, the things that we pray for, be aligned with God's word and therefore have these prayers be spoken of and come to pass. Very, very interesting how this looks. And there's a lot of discussion on that. That's why we have a whole topic on it. So we're going to look at what that actually means when it talks about answered prayer. October 16th, we're going to be looking at God's strange act. The strange act of people say, well, if God's so loving and kind, why is it that he, he wipes the earth clean? Sin is no more. He did it in the days of Noah. Is that because that's Old Testament theology? Is that Old Testament thinking? Well, what does it mean that when God comes here to make the earth new, what does that mean? It seems so strange, and so it's been called by many God's strange act. What does that mean? What does it look like? What does the Bible really say? Then we look at October 18th, which is a Wednesday. This topic has been talked about by many until you're blue in the face, and that's the millennium. People have so many understandings on what this means, what it looks like, and we want to know what does the Bible say from the word itself when it talks about the millennium. And so tonight, we're going to be going and diving deep into the coming of the lawless one. But before we do, we're going to spend some time um, in praise. And so I'm going to invite my brother, uh, Jonathan, and he's going to lead us out in some meditative music as we spend some time um, reflecting on that. Happy Sabbath, everyone. How many of us have friends? But not, not the ones that you see every day, but friend, friend, that you can call a friend. You can go to their house, open the fr refrigerator, and eat whatever is in there without asking. <laughs> I, I, I don't know about that, right? <laughs> Um. <laughs> we have a friend and his name is Jesus right and um, even though I like to sing contemporary Christian music I think some of the most beautiful songs are found in the hymns and this is one of my favorite ones it's called What a Friend We Have in Jesus so we can, we can put the slides in there
temptations is a trouble anyway we should never be this good take it to the Lord in prayer can we find a friend so to the law in prayer nor we weak and heavy laden cumbered with a lot of care precious Savior still our refuge take it to the Lord Despise for safety. Take it to the Lord in prayer. In His arms, you stake and shield Thou will find a solace there. Amen. What do we do when we fall down on our knees and we scrape ourselves and we have all this blood on our arms and legs? We turn our eyes upon Jesus, right? Life has, and it's tough sometimes, and we get hit, we fall, we trip, but that is the beauty of, of you know, the message that Jesus left for us, that he always has healing for us. And this is one of my favorite ones. Turn your eyes open, Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely near in the light of his glory and grace one more time turn your eyes upon Jesus look full in wonderful faith and the things of birth will grow strangely clean in the light of his glory and grace Amen I want to thank Jonathan for leading us in that. And there's one thing that's reliable. He talked about friends coming to your house and raiding your kitchen. And it reminds me, I had a number of friends who, when I was growing up, always came to my house and raided our fridge. And I just think, I'm like, did I ever do that to anyone? I'm like, no, but man, wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice? But that happened a lot growing up, so you brought back good memories in that, with friends constantly over, people always eating out of the fridge, and my mom coming home, like, where's all the food? We're like, yeah. We had, uh, had some friends over. They kind of ate the food. 
But if there's one thing that is reliable in, in this life, that is Jesus, amen? Um, for those watching online as well, we really do have a friend of Jesus. And we've been singing and talking about that these past couple weeks. And we hope that you're getting a better picture of who God is. And that's what we want to talk about tonight is the picture of who God is, but also what the other side is. What is this discussion on this lawless one? And we've been talking about the central theme of Revelation, which is Revelation 12, 13, and 14. We introduced it a little bit uh, this past Wednesday. Hey, we talked about, you know, this, this theme, this picture. And then we're going to be talking about Revelation 13 uh, a little bit tomorrow or on another night. And we're going to be discussing about this beast as well. And tonight we're going to be looking at another theme related. So it's all kind of related on this discussion point of Jesus and the other side of what is not accordance to following God and what he would have us to do um, in our lives. And so the coming of the lawless one is a big topic and we don't want to sweep it under the rug or go too quickly in it because it's very practical um, onto what we're discussing tonight. So the other night we discussed the second coming. We discussed how important it was, the climax of Earth's history, and something actually happens before that. And we want to discuss that tonight. Well, does Jesus just come? Is it just out of nowhere? Do we have any signs of preparation? Or do we know what's right or what's wrong and preparing to see what's the difference of how maybe God would have us live? Um, there's something powerful that the scriptures talk about. And it talks about this idea of this lawless one. And in some ways, this idea of the Antichrist. And this is huge because Paul specifically talks about this in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, and we want to turn to that right now. If you have your Bibles with you, or we can look at the screen, um, you'll see this text, 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. But before we do this, I, I did forget to pray, and so I would like to, for us to have a quick uh, word of prayer. So let us pray. Uh, dear God, we are grateful to be here on this Friday to, to worship you, to learn about you, to dive into your word of truth. Uh, your scriptures tell us that we are to be sanctified, sanctified by your truth. Your word is truth. And so, God, we want to just be given the path, given the direction, light the path that is, that is darkened and that is twisting and turning and show us which way to go that we might be able to be good stewards of our lives and the time that we have available here on this earth because we don't know how long we individually have and we want to make sure that we follow you faithfully. Bless this conversation now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn back to the text. Uh, 2 Thessalonians, verse 2, 3 to 4, and it reads this. Let no one deceive you. Remember, we talked about this a lot. Deception, it's a big thing. And it starts us off by talking about that. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless that day is what? This understanding is the second coming. That's what that day means. Jesus' second coming will not come unless the what? The falling away comes first. So there's this phrase, this falling away. What is that? The falling away comes first and the man of sin, now we see another phrase, the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. What else does it say? This son of perdition, this man of sin opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. So before the Antichrist, this person is revealed before Jesus comes and two things must happen. The first is this falling away, which is this version of apostasy because you're falling away from the truth. You're falling away from what the truth has. You're on a path and you go the other way. You are falling away. And this happens inside of Christianity, because how can you fall away unless you're on the right path? So this is talking about God's church, people in the church, people who are claimed to be a believers, they're falling away. 
And then it says that the man of sin appears, and all this happens before the second coming of Christ. This is very clear. But notice what else it says. Let's go on. The scripture tells us, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. So we could expect what? A falling away in apostasy. And this is an issue when? Back in Jesus' day, it says this is already at work. So this was happening when this time was written, when the book of the Bible was written in First, when the, Paul is writing this to the people in Thessalonica, if I could say that word, this happened back in the first century. So this was already happening. This is not something that's in the future. We throw it on ahead and say, well, this is the time of the end. Jesus isn't coming. So this is going to happen later. You can see clearly that what's happening then is still happening since Jesus died and rose again. It's been happening well, what is that? You're going to find out something very, very powerful that speaks to us. And by the way, whatever this is, it grows and it grows until the Antichrist is revealed. This is not a small issue. This is a big issue. But notice, what does that mean? Well, let's look at some other texts. Remember, Scripture interprets Scripture. So what does that mean? This time of the end, before the last day, this man of perdition, this lawless one, this son of perdition. What does this mean? What does it look like? Second Timothy tells us something very powerful. Second Timothy 3, 1 to 4 says this. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. You see that phrase? Before the day, the last days, it's talking about the same thing. The last days, this perilous time shall come. For men shall be what? Lovers of their own selves, covetousness, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontent, fierce, despisers of those who that are good. This is very powerful. Let's keep reading. It also says, traitors, heady, high-minded lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. This is something that's very telling. Something is happening that probably has never happened before. You know, um, when I look around, you'll see this in every generation. When I was a child sitting in the pews, I heard preachers, evangelists saying these things. It's never been a bad time as it is before. And let's be honest, throughout the the whole history of humanity. Yeah, it is getting worse because the scripture tells us it's going to get worse before it gets better. And right before Jesus comes, it's going to be so bad he's going to have to come. So naturally we can say as time's going on, it's going to get worse. So with every generation, probably most people are going to say, well, when I was young, it was like this and it's so bad now. Well, you're probably right, but guess what? That doesn't mean right there Jesus is coming, but we do see something that is happening more and more frequently. I'll tell you this. When I was young, you see, I'm going to start now already. People are like, oh my gosh. Well, when I was young, it was worse. Some of the young people here, even online, were like, oh my gosh. But notice what's happening. You know, there are so many school shootings like there never were before. There's, it's never been like that. I don't know if some of you remember Columbine, the Columbine shooting. You go now to schools, there are kids bringing guns and shooting kids, and this has never happened before. And some people say, where is this coming from? And you know, it's very interesting. One of the passages we, we just read, which we overlook, we say, well, people are lovers of themselves, they're haters, they're liars, this and that. One that I look at, because I'm also a parent, is disobedient to parents. I have never seen kids so disobedient to parents. I mean, it used to be where parents would give their kids a look. Uh, my parents would give me a look, and I'm like, I'm good. That's it. Man, now you see kids yelling, pointing their finger, and parents don't really do anything. Now, there's different ways. Some people say, well, I want to spank my kids. I don't want to spank my kids, whatever. All I'm saying is the time we're living in, kids are just all over the place. Some people are saying, well, is that attributed to gun shooting? I'm not saying it is. I'm saying is there's so many issues with kids in this generation that there hasn't been before. 
Why is this happening? And we're going to get into that a little bit. But I want us to note something that's also changing, and that's how social media affects things. I was in a training many years ago in a previous church, and they were telling us the effects of social media and kids on this regard. Kids are being abducted and being sold in rates that has never been before, especially here in this country. They were telling us some, there's some statistics here in Riverside. If you're online and you're not from California, you're around the States, just bear with this example. But for those of you who live in California, you're online, those here, you know there's a junction over there in Riverside area with the 215 freeway, the 91 freeway, and the 60 freeway. That spot right there, we were in a training many years ago, and we were with some people who were involved with social media, with the police, and there was a church school with a school attached to it, and they were telling us the dangers of social media, that people were pretending to be adults, pretending, or pretending to be kids, just like the other kids. They have pictures, they get a picture off Google, they dress as this, they talk like this, they know the lingo, they say, hey, let's go hang out, let's do this. And the kids go there because this person listens to them. Their parents don't listen. They don't approve. They feel, find acceptance in these places. They've never met this person. They just see a picture of someone. And finally, they go into the street. They run out of their house. They meet, in an, meet them at a park. They meet them in an alleyway. Boys and girls. And it's these child abductors. They take these kids. And specifically in that area, there's different county lines right there along those freeways. And if a child gets abducted, they cross the freeway, that county line stops and the police don't do anything. Very shocking. If your child gets abducted, gets on that freeway, and they head down to Mexico, they have to cross county lines. So basically, if your child gets caught and they're on their way to Mexico, they, they, they could be gone before anyone does anything. And this has been happening a lot. And that's just here locally. This is happening with our children. This is happening with our youth. This is happening with older people finding ways, as it says, people are becoming lovers of themselves. Children are being abducted, they're being killed, they're being sex trafficked. These are things that may have happened in the past, but in proportion as it's never been before. These are examples like, wow, what is happening? In our backyard, and I'm not talking about social media and internet being the most evil thing, this and that. I'm just saying this is, what the, this is the society we live in now. Um, where is this coming from? Why is this happening? All these things are very important for us to understand. And how did the world change this way so quickly? This happened very, very quickly. It's happened... I wouldn't say overnight, but pretty drastically, the shootings, the child abductions, the disobedience to parents in so many different ways all over the TV, people laugh at it. And some people are looking at this thing um, called situational ethics. Has anyone ever heard of this? Situational ethics, I actually heard this in college too, and this was something that we were being introduced to. There's this famous professor named Joseph Fletcher, and this was in the 1960s where he introduced a system of ethics known as relativism, where morality depends on situations that, based on the right circumstance, anything could technically be moral. There's technically no such thing as right and wrong. It really depends on the situation. It gave an example. It says that there was an, uh, a couple, they crashed their car. And it was a husband and a wife. And they crashed their car. And the car flipped over. And they're in the country. They're in the middle of nowhere. No cell phones. No way to people just hitchhike or anything or call tow truck. Cars flipped over. The wife's inside. The husband is with a broken arm or something. He can't really do much. He can't even lift the car. It's too heavy. He runs to a house. He sees a house far in the distance. He goes there. The door's locked. He sees a kid in the backyard, and he's playing, and, and he's saying, help, help, my wife is trapped. I'm afraid something's going to happen. She's going to die, and he's struggling to do something, but the house is locked, and the kid's in the back, and he needs help. And the question was asked by this professor, in this, this was a real situation they used, how many of you would jump over the fence and get that kid to force him to help you? Where's the phone? Where's this? Where's that? And you'd be surprised how many responded in that aspect, they would do anything, even hurt that child to get what they needed to save their mother, their spouse, their whatever. 
This is considered those examples of situational ethics. And this example was actually used in the textbook. And people agreed, well, it's okay to harm that kid. You're not going to kill him, but you put some harm on him to make sure you get what you need to help that person. And this is a very remarkable example because situations like these are used often in understanding of the difference between rights and wrong. Of course you wouldn't hurt a child. Of course you wouldn't do this. But in the right circumstances, well, it raises a question on morality. Anything might be right. Remember this idea that this isn't right, this isn't wrong, this may be true for you, but it's not true for me. Or what's true for me may not be true for you. And we see that this was not introduced into the 1960s. We see that this was actually introduced at the beginning of the book of Genesis, where God told Adam and Eve, do not touch of the fruit of good and evil. And Lucifer jumped in, the snake, and what did he say? Are you sure? Are you really going to die? I don't think God really meant that. I mean, did he really mean not to touch it? Did he really mean not to eat it? I mean, let's let's play with words here. What does it mean to really disobey what God has asked us to do? This is nothing new But they gave it a term, a course, and this is something that's constantly been happening. It's a a mental exercise to question biblical morality and change our way of thinking. Notice this. This was in an educational pamphlet, and it was being handed out to kids in school. I want you guys to take a look at this um, and read this uh, text here for yourself. It says this. Early on in life... You will be exposed to different value systems from your family, church, or synagogue, and friends. You may accept some of these values without questioning whether or not they are the right values for you. But you may eventually realize that some of these values conflict with each other. Without questioning whether or not they are the right values for you, but you may eventually realize that some of these values conflict with each other. So basically, sorry, I just read the thing twice. As you're looking at this, it's it's really saying your experience in your life is more important than what scripture says is right and what is wrong. If you find your car flipped over and and you find a need that, that, that you have to have and you might have to hurt a child to get it, you know what? In that situation, it's okay. It's okay. And we see this from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. The, the devil, the snake, came to Eve and said, come on, like, let's not draw a hard and fast rule with God. God said this, but come on. It's not a big deal. In fact, God actually is hiding something from you. Does that sound familiar? Well, if I break this, I'll actually get something better. So it's actually a good thing for me to break this idea of morality. Let's continue reading. It is up to you to decide your own value system, to build your own ethical code, you will have to learn what is right and wrong for yourself through experience. You know, I get what this is saying, but we also have to understand, is this what we mean when we're talking about what's right and wrong? Does the Bible hold truth for us on what is right and what is wrong? Is everything based on what you experience, based on what you feel, based on what you think might be right for you and not right for someone else? I want you to look at this. This is a statistic. Um, a world report in um, 2002, and it says this. 73% of students said that when their professors taught about ethical issues, The usual message was that uniform standards of right and wrong don't exist. Now, in the past 40 years, you you look at that, people understood, in a way, maybe what was right and wrong. And now we're looking at, well, morality, it has a pendulum. There's a spectrum. There's things that could be right in one situation. They could be wrong in another. Let's look at this. 10 to 20 percent of students could not bring themselves to criticize the Nazi extermination of Europe's Jews. 
Some students expressed personal distaste for what the Nazis did, but they were not willing to say that the Nazis were wrong. Since no culture can be judged from the outside and no individual can challenge the worldview of another. Mass murder, genocide. It's pretty hard to say, well, I don't think they really meant to do it or it's not really that bad because they had a reason and if I was them, I might do it too. You see where this spectrum of coming, well, there's no such thing as right and wrong. We see this constantly happening, especially now where you see Christians are being chastised for maybe believing in a certain thing. Now more than ever as Christians, if you call yourself a Christian, some of us even hide that from people. We're afraid. We're embarrassed. We're around work or friends or social circle. circle, And you, someone asks about church or religion. Man, many people feel the, the, the kind of uneasiness like, uh-oh, I might be found out. Or, oh, people might find out I'm a Christian. Well, if they find out I'm a Christian, they might think I'm rigid, I'm legal. It's this. There's, a, there's for some reason a fear. And this is the world we live in today because if you're a Christian, you're associated with being a legalist, with being dogmatic, with being what you're against, rather what people are for. And Jesus, notice, let's look at what Jesus has to say. It's not about humans building their own morality, but notice what Jesus has to even tell us in the word of God. Matthew chapter 7, 21, chapter 7, 21 to 23 says this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus is, isn't talking to atheists or secular people here. Jesus is talking to his own people. He's talking to believers. He's talking to, to people who call themselves Christians because they're calling Jesus Lord, which means master, which means I'm following you. And just because we say, Lord, Lord, hey, I believe in you. I follow you. I, I do churchy things. I have these spiritual disciplines. I have these marks of Christianity. And Jesus is saying, look, just because you say, Lord, Lord, doesn't mean you're doing the will of my Father. This passage is aimed at people who claim to believe in God, but they, for, they, they refuse to do his will because God actually has standards. God has ways of expressing of who he is and what he is like and how we are supposed to show the world what he's like. Notice what the scripture goes on to say. It says this, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. What does it say? What is the phrase? Lawlessness. And what is the text that we're looking at? The man of what? And who said these words? Are these, these are Jesus' words himself. Those who practice lawlessness. I'm going to say, I don't know you. That's powerful. And it's actually all over the scriptures. We're just finding these phrases here. This is not something people made up. This is deeply biblical things. Jesus himself said, people say, Lord, Lord. God's like, wait a second. <laughs> I don't know who you are because the world can't distinguish between you and them. I don't know who you are. Well, who would Jesus say that to? Those who practice lawlessness. There's no difference. Well, what's the issue? This mystery of lawlessness has been happening since the beginning. And according to the Bible, it's a huge thing because it talks about even when that time comes. Now the question comes to us, has lawlessness crept into the church? Has it crept into the faith? Well, look, the people in the church practice lawlessness. Well, people will say, well, in the Old Testament, God is against sin, but he talks about the sin of Israel in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, he talks to the church. And he talks about this lawlessness in the last days. Paul says the last days. He talks about this falling away, and he talks about this in the context of the church. 
this lawlessness. We talk about this situational ethics where there's no such thing as right and wrong. It depends. This lawlessness is continuing and it's getting stronger and it's getting bigger. I want you to be aware of, of, of a Gallup poll. This, this is a powerful one. It says this. There is very little difference in the behavior of the churched and the, and the unchurched on a wide range of items, including lying, cheating, and stealing. What did they discover? There's very little difference between the church and unchurched in what? Lying, cheating, and stealing. Isn't that fascinating? People in the church are unsure of what lying, cheating, and stealing is. This is not people looking in the church. This is people looking out of the church and in the church. And they're looking at Christians like, look, Christians don't know what lying, cheating, and stealing is. These are some hard questions we need to ask ourselves. Where do some Christians get the idea that it's okay to sin? Where do we get this idea to live in conflict with God's moral law to do anything we please? I want us to look at this text here. When he, as God's only begotten son, gave himself to die on the cross for the sins of the whole world, he ended the age of the law and introduced age of grace from that time on. This is a very popular thing we see in the world around us. This is very popular in Bible prophecy, and it matters tonight because we need to listen very carefully to what this says. Let's read on. It tells us individuals have been able to be eternally saved through faith by repenting of their sins and calling on Christ to save them. That is why it's called the age of grace. Now there's a lot of truth in that. We understand that we are saved by grace. It's not by our works and, and, and saving comes by that. We understand that. But people say that this is only for people in the New Testament. Do we believe that? No, at least biblically, the Bible doesn't say that, but there's a lot of people, a lot of Christians who say there's a difference between the Old Testament and there's a difference between the New Testament. And I'm so glad as we read our Bibles, we know that, guess what? No, there's no difference in the old and in the new. And if this is new for you, even those online, guess what? We need to understand what the Bible says on that because this plays a part to understanding what's right, what's wrong, what's cheating, what's stealing. Is it okay here? Is it okay there? No, this is God's moral law. These things don't change in any generation, in any time period, in any sort of situation. It, this is the law of God. This doesn't change. And unfortunately, when people say these things change, that starts that slippery slope to say, you know what? Did God really say that? Does the word of God really teach that? And we're going to dive into that a little bit to understand what that means. Because Hebrews 11, if you read it, tells me that the Old Testament will be in heaven too. The people in Hebrews chapter 11, remember, it's the faith chapter. If you haven't had a chance to read that, it's called like the Hall of Fame. You know, in sports, they have the Hall of Fame, the best players ever. The Hebrews 11 talks about the Hall of Fame of the, these mighty men and women in the Old Testament. And it says that they're going to be in heaven. So how are they saved? How are these people in the Old Testament, if we separate Old Testament from New Testament, that means they were saved differently. But Hebrews 11 outlines how they were saved. And it's very telling if that's in fact the case. Old Testament is law, how you're saved, and New Testament is grace. How were they saved? Were they saved by obedience? Were they saved by these sacrifices? What did it actually mean? Are there two methods of salvation? Hebrews 10.4 actually tells us it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away the sins. Old Testament and New Testament is the same. In fact, Acts chapter 4 verse 12 tells us something very powerful. Notice what the text says. It says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby men must be saved. There is only one way in which we must be saved. There is no other 
way. I, I, I wish I had a picture of this, but I want you to picture that the cross is right here on this podium. And if I stand on this side, this is going to be the Old Testament over here. And over here, this is going to be the New Testament. And the cross is, is, is between us right here in the middle. And I like to share with you and submit to you the people in the Old Testament, they weren't saved by their works. They weren't saved by the law. All they did was looked forward to the cross. They looked forward to what Jesus was going to do. And what we do who live post-cross, we look back at what Jesus did. Jesus did that, and we were saved. There is no difference between the way they did things in the Old Testament and the New Testament. We were all saved by the grace of God, by faith in God, by his goodness, and it's not our works. And the Bible describes that, and we're going to look at that, because we see that Paul emphasizes that the just will live by faith. Paul actually says that, and we think he wrote that himself, but actually, notice what the Bible says. That actually is found in an Old Testament text, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, and what does it say in the Old Testament? What does that verse say to you? But the just shall live by what? By works? By, by animal sacrifices? Because of a priest? Because of striving and grumbling and saying, Lord, please save me and let me earn my own salvation. Because that's what people preach is the Old Testament. We see in the Old Testament very clearly and in multiple parts. So we're going to look at that. We are saved by the same thing. We are saved by God's grace through faith. Through faith, there is no other name under heaven by which men must be saved. It's always been Jesus. It's always been the cross. And all these sacrifices point to Jesus. I want to introduce to you to say something else that you probably already knew. We know that Abel is an Old Testament person. In fact, he was one of the first few people. And when he offered his sacrifice that was appropriate and that God looked on and received well. In Hebrews 11, you will see it says that Abel offered his offering in what? In faith. Hebrews 11, if everyone any questions and says you're saved by works in the Old Testament, you're like, well, what is Hebrews 11 about? All the people in the Old Testament, it always says in there, these people were saved by faith. By the grace of God, through faith, from believing. They weren't saved by their works. Nowhere in the Old Testament are you saved by your works. They looked forward to the cross. We look backward to the cross. It's always been the cross. There is no age of law. There is no age of grace. It's always been an age of God doing it all. Abraham, we know this as well. Abraham, how was Abraham saved? Let's look at Romans chapter 4, reflecting on, 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 on who Abraham was, the, the father of our faith of three different religions. You look at the Jews, you look at the people of Islam, you look at Christians. Abraham is a huge figure. And it tells us this in Romans 4, 2 to 3, it says, For if Abraham was justified by what? By works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Oh, Abraham was in Old Testament or New Testament? Old Testament. It talks about him in the Old Testament. And let's go on and it says this. For what does the scripture say? Abraham what? He believed. He believed in God and it was counted to him as what? Through belief, he had a relationship with God based on his faith. And some people are confused about this Old Testament uh, age of law. And it's like, no, it has always been God's grace. And so we, we do see that there's some laws in the Bible. We want to talk about that really quickly, that it talks about more than one kind of law. There's four of them, but majority there's two. So we want to talk about that right now, that there is a law that the Bible calls God's moral law, his Ten Commandments. In fact, we talked about this a while in the sanctuary in, in that the Ark of the Covenant, inside the sanctuary, inside the temple, in the Ark, where the covering cherubims, which, which, which is what Lucifer was before he fell, the morning star, on the seat, the mercy seat between those angels, and inside the Ark was what? The Ten Commandments. That's God's moral law. And we say that that seat 
where the angels cover, that's the throne of God. And so if that's the case in heaven, we see that God's law is still even there as well. It's not just here, it's in heaven. It's a moral law. It wasn't given to us at Sinai. It's always been there. This is God's law. But then we see on the other side, beside the Ark of the Covenant, we see all these human written laws, these ceremonial laws, how to do animal sacrifices, um, how to do these feasts, how to do all these things. And so between these two laws, which do you think became unnecessary at the cross? These ceremonial laws, these animal sacrifices. And why is it that we no longer needed those animal sacrifices? Why didn't we need them anymore? What happened? Jesus Christ the Lamb of God died, the perfect Lamb, the spotless Lamb, the perfect sacrifice, and there was no need for any more sacrifices. We see that inside the Gospels. When Jesus died, it said very strategically and pointedly, when he died, he said it is finished. It said the veil in the temple, what did it do? It tore from top to bottom. And that veil could not be ripped with hands. That, that cloak was heavy. That was thick. There's no chance that that just rips. It was literally torn. Some people say an angel tore that, say there's no more of this. No more ceremonial laws. No more needing for sacrifice because Jesus has now paid the price that we no longer need animal sacrifices. Salvation has always been by faith. It's always been by faith. Never any other way. We look backward to the cross. The people in the Old Testament look forward. And Hebrews 11 and many other texts and Habakkuk and all these things prove to it. It's never ever been any other way, which also means that God's moral law has never ever been done away with. It still applies to us today. I remember seeing one of my favorite evangelists growing up. I've shared with one of our brothers here the impact he had on my life, but I remember there was a sermon and he called vol volunteers to the front. He was very good at doing that. He called like five or six volunteers and he had them all stand up. He says, this person represents this, this person represents this, 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 and he goes down the line. He says, okay, the first person represents sin. The next person represents law. The next person represents a sacrifice. The next person represents Jesus. The next person may be the Holy Spirit. The next one is the spiritual gifts that we have. The next one is the church. And the next one is the second coming. He says, you see how all this lines up here? He says, well, let's deal with this first one here. This issue called sin. What is sin? Transgression of what? Transgression of the law. He says, well, guess what? If there's no such thing of the law, guess what? There's no sin. So now what do we do? There's no sin, or there's no law, there's no sin. Guess what? We don't need a sacrifice. Guess what? We don't need Jesus. Guess what? We don't need the Holy Spirit. We don't need the gifts of grace because we already have them because we're not sinful. And then we definitely don't need the church, and we don't need Jesus to come because everyone's already here. Does that sound like everything is okay? Does it sound like everything is good in this world? Does it sound like everything is right? Where do we start? Where do we pinpoint? Where do we start? Guess what? There is something wrong. There is a right and there is wrong. And it's God's law. It's never changed. It's never changed. But we have people in the world, in the church, who say there's no such thing as this anymore. And that's been happening since the cross and even before. Guess what? Jesus died. Let's get this thing out of here. We don't need it anymore. Lawlessness. Jesus died. There's no more law. We don't need it. The church preaches that. Churches preach that. We all know it. I'm so glad we don't. Because the word of God doesn't change. In fact, don't take my word for it. Let's keep going and see what the word of God actually has to say. It's very powerful because didn't Jesus abolish the moral law at the cross? People ask that question. Did Jesus abolish the law at the cross? And some things have been erased here. Huh, that's strange. Let's see, what happened here? Where are we? Did I get something wrong here? What's going on here? Oh, here we go. Let me see. 
Here you go. First John 3, 4, and it reads this. Whoever so committed sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the what? Transgression of the law. Very important. Okay, let's keep moving on. Okay, here we go. Did Jesus abolish the moral law at the cross? This is very, very important. We see this all over TV. We see this with Christian evangelists. You see this all over the place. But notice what the book of Matthew says. Matthew 5, verse 18 and 19. For surely I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away. And remember, when Jesus says he comes down, it says the elements are going to melt. Heaven and earth are going to be transformed and changed. This is really talking about the second coming, right? And even beyond, or maybe not even that. It says not one jolt or tittle will by any means pass away until this law is fulfilled. And it says this. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men to do so shall be called what? The least in the kingdom of heaven. Now let's be honest. People will say... People will say, well, the Bible says that isn't God's moral law is abolished. People say, well, what about this? Well, let, let me ask you this. Is the earth still under your feet? It's pretty clear by looking at this text, nothing has changed. This idea of not one jot or tittle, it's like dotting your I's, crossing your T's, all these things. The Ten Commandments, some people will say, are just for the Jews, but I'm a Gentile. I'm not, I'm not a Jew. So does this even, even, even apply? Wasn't this given on Mount Sinai? And the question we have to ask ourselves, well, was there any, is there such thing as sin? Is there such thing as breaking of the law before Mount Sinai? That's what we need to look at. Is it possible to break the law of God before Mount Sinai? Because if the argument is if it's given at Mount Sinai, that means nothing else was wrong before that. Does that make sense? This is very, very important for us to understand in, in, in the Bible. But let me ask you this. Was Abraham a Jew? No. Jew, the, the Jewish nation, the idea of Jew, came hundreds of years later. So I want us to look at something very important um, that's here in Genesis. Genesis chapter 26, and it reads this. Because that, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Abraham apparently was keeping the law hundreds of years before the Ten Commandments was given. So what law is this talking about? I want us to also look, can, can Cain broke God's law? Cain broke God's law by murdering his brother. But how could Cain break God's law without there being the law given at Mount Sinai? Does this make sense? People were saying the law was done away because it was given to the Jews. It was given on Mount Sinai. But the reality is, well, then, was there such thing as sin before that? And if there is, what commandments is this referencing? This is very important to understand. Let's, let's answer another one. What about Lucifer? Wasn't Lucifer before the Ten Commandments? Guess what he did? He lied to Abraham. He lied, sorry, he lied to Adam and Eve. He lied to the angels. He, covered God, he coveted God's throne. He wanted to be like God. We read about that. And he called himself a God. All these are violations of the Ten Commandments, but people are saying that God's moral law was only for the Jews. It's only for them, and it's done away with because now the sacrifices are done. Well, that apparently was not what this was talking about. The Ten Commandments is not something that's just done away with. In no time is it okay to murder someone on God's law. Wouldn't you want to be in a place where there's no murdering, where there's no stealing, where people actually kept their word? We don't have to have contracts on everything. Used to be a handshake was good enough. I remember I was living um, in, in seminary and I was living in a professor's house. He has a basement. We don't have basements here in California because of earthquakes. It's so sad. But I remember I, I saw basements in, in, in the Midwest for the first time. I was like, wow, this is so cool. Like, why do we have this in California? Oh, that's right. Um, and we're living in his basement. We were renting it out and we negotiated a price. Me and uh, another seminarian, we lived... Um, that means studying to be a pastor. Sorry, jargon. Seminarians, going to seminary, we're studying to be pastors. So me and another seminarian were living in his basement, and he says, let's just have a verbal contract. And he, was, uh, he wanted to do that, and so we're like, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't do that. I'm like, well, what's the worst that could happen? My roommate's all like, no, man. 
we need to have a written contract. And so we go back up. I'm kind of embarrassed. I'm kind of shy. And I go over there. And we knock on his door. He's like, hey, professor, how are you doing? And, and I know we shook hands. We had a verbal agreement. But do you mind if we have a contract? And he just smiled. He's like, sure, no problem. And I was like, ooh, that's it? It's easy. I thought he was going to be like, what happened? You don't trust me, this and that? My roommate said, hey, just in case something happens. And something did happen. There was a flood in, inside, and we had to take care of things. So that protected us, but he was going to do it anyway. But all this to say is, you know, people are, are skeptical. Like, well, what could happen? What about this? What about that? Someone's word may not always hold water. And so we have contracts now for everything which isn't necessarily bad. I'm simply saying the reality in the world that we live in. People's word and a handshake no longer is enough. And so this is an example of we want to live in these things. We don't want people to lie. We don't want people to cheat. We don't want people to steal. But what does this actually say about God? Does this law reveal God's goodness rather than a devil who says we could live how we want do whatever I want hasn't the devil already tried to abolish God's law because God has truly said I am the same yesterday today and tomorrow God is always merciful that is always good he's not going to change his mind on loving you on showing his grace this is the God we serve. God's law is a picture of his character and that's why the devil hates his law. God's character can't change and neither can his moral principles. You can always count on God. You see in these business conventions or in these people who change the world, you've probably heard this phrase. If not, I'll share it with you. It's the only people who change the world are the people who the world couldn't change. Those are change makers. Those are people of discipline. Those are people who see something and they go after it. They know it's true. Jesus was a change maker for the better. You couldn't change Jesus. Jesus knew his purpose. He knew his mission. And no matter what situational ethic people threw at him, Jesus always spoke truth. Jesus always spoke truth. You remember when they brought up a coin? The Jews hated the Romans, so they try to trick Jesus and say, look, if Jesus has this coin and he says, don't pay the Romans, they're going to kill him because he did this. But if he says, let's give the money to the Romans, then the Jews are going to hate him because he's worshiping Romans. And so they brought a coin and tried to tempt him, a situational ethic. Jesus, should Jews, should these people pay taxes to Caesar? And they're standing there gloating like he's stuck. He's going to have to side with one of them. And Jesus didn't change. He picked up the coin. He says, whose face is on the coin? And they said, Caesar. And very eloquently, very wise, very brilliant, he says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. Wow. Jesus doesn't play that. He stayed true to who he was. You know the other one? Woman caught in adultery. Stone her. The law of Moses says we should stone her. What do you say? Well, if he says stone her, we could arrest him for murder. But if he doesn't stone her, he's breaking the law of Moses. He's stuck. It's a situational ethic, right? Right? We're looking at situational ethics. People say, well, you know, I mean, we got, we got to let her, we got to let her live. So you know what? God's law doesn't apply. She committed adultery. Forget it. I know the Mo Moses' law says this, but, you know, Testament says this, whatever. Go ahead and kill her. Well, Jesus goes to jail. <laughs> Right? The Romans are like, hey, you can't do that. Who are you to be able to stone that? But what does Jesus do? He who is without sin casts the first stone. <laughs> Whoa! Well, I guess I can't throw a stone. I can. Everyone walks away. Does Jesus give her a free pass? No. He addresses her too. He says, hey, First, where are your accusers? She says, they're nowhere, Lord. Then he speaks to her, hey, go and sin no more. Jesus addressed the other people? Absolutely. Did Jesus address her too? Yes. In truth, but in gentleness and in love. 
Jesus doesn't sidestep these things. We think he does, but the scripture's clear. God doesn't change. Jesus doesn't change. He knows the human heart, and he knows what we deal with, but he also says there's a standard, and he's going to uphold that, and he calls us to do the same thing. That's the really hard thing. What is the right thing, and what does God command us? How do we do it? That's the real situational ethic. How do we apply God's truth? Because we don't know how to apply it. We're stuck. We pray for wisdom. That's what we do. That's very important. This is the book of Hebrews, and it talks about that. Let's read it. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16 says this. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law into where? Their hearts and their minds, I will write them. See, Jesus, when he was on earth, he had that. He had the law of God in his mind and in his heart. And he saw the, what the people were, because we're so obsessed about money. The Bible talks about one thing the most, it's, it's about money. Constantly, how to use your money. Don't be wasteful. Be frugal and save and, and gambling. Talks about that. Talks about a lot of other things. Like God is very clear on how to do this because he knows we use it to live. And so they brought him the coin. And Jesus says, hey, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but remember, give to God what belongs to God. Remember that. Jesus didn't sidestep these things. He hit them head on because it was written where? On his mind and on his heart. He knew the truth. He didn't compromise, but he did it in gentleness and in love. That's the power of Jesus. And he modeled it to us. And I think we ought to do the same too. This is the character of God. First John 2-3 to tells us this. Now by this we know that we know him if we what? If we keep his commandments. Let's read on to say this. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments means he's a liar. And what? Truth is not in him. Ouch. Lord, Lord. God's like, I don't know you. Because you practice what? Lawlessness. There's no difference between you and anyone else. What do you mean you're saved by grace? You're saved as It hasn't changed your life. Grace ought to change your life. It ought to empower you to, to show the love of God, to show the grace of God. There's no difference. In the last days, we say, Lord, Lord, you can't even identify. And Revelation 14 says, God's name will be written on their foreheads. His character, very, very important, very powerful for us to keep in mind. Revelation 14, 12 says this. Look, here is the what? The patience. Guess what? Is patience easy? No, patience is, it's very, especially in this day and age, we are microwave Christians. We want it in 30 seconds. If we don't have it now, we quit. God, I waited at least a day. Nothing happened, so I gave up. You know, fasting was actually a practice that people did. People would fast. People would pray for things for days and weeks and months. We pray for a day, and we're like, man, I'm exhausted. We don't have patience. As a culture, as a people, that's in the church too. We don't have patience. It says, here is the patience of the who? God's people. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It's written on their hearts, on their minds. And notice the devil doesn't like it. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, the church. And he went and made war with the rest of her offspring who do what? Who keep the what? The commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. There's only two groups at the end, the dragon and the lamb. Which one are we? Which one are we? The enemy is angry. Why? Because he knows his time is short and he knows that the commandments, what do the commandments do to the devil? They expose him. Lying? (laughs) That's not right. That's that's God's that's God's stamp. We're not gonna do that. Stealing, cheating, backstabbing, idolatry, adultery, all these. This isn't about the person you're with. This is about your relationship with God. This is a God thing. This is the moral law that belongs to God. And if the devil could say it doesn't apply, 
It's hard to make a distinguishment of this. Do we do this out of a sense of duty? Do we do this to be saved? Do we do this so we could earn heaven? Not at all. Notice what the scripture says. If you what? If you love me, keep my commandments. If you what? How many of you have someone you love? Man, I'll tell you this. When I'm with my boys, I have to brace myself. Because daddy, I want this. Daddy, can you do this? Daddy, can you make me this? Daddy, do this. My boys love it when I give them a bath. They're old enough to wash themselves, clean themselves. But like, daddy, can you wash me? My six and four, and I'm there, and I'm washing them. I'm putting them in a towel. I'm like, all right, go to the room. It's like, daddy, carry me. I'm like, oh, come on. I'm tired all day doing this. So I pick up one, take him over there, get him dressed. He's like, daddy, pick me up and take me to the other room. Oh, my gosh, pick him up, take the other other room. Then I go back to to the bathroom and washing the other one because I love taking a bath. And then my other son's like, daddy, can you? I'm like, okay, so daddy, pick me up. I don't know how long my my, my back is going to last. So I pray. I'm like, Lord, please help my back to last. But do do I do this because I'm obligated? Do I do this because I have to? No, I love my boys. You do things for the people you love because you love them. You love them. If you love me, keep my commandments. God's law was never abolished. Romans chapter 3, 28 tells us this. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the law. And people say, oh, the law is gone. Well, guess what? Let's keep reading. Didn't we talk about that? You got to keep reading what the Bible says. That's verse 28. What does it say in verse 31? Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith alone from deeds apart from the deeds of the law. And then 31 says, do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Do you see what's important? The law actually points to our need of grace. Many of you have probably heard, um, well, let me finish reading this. It says, for sin shall not have dominion over you. You shall not be under the law, but under grace. And so you've probably heard this example before, so I'm going to use it again. It's very practical, and it's for every generation because we all have police officers, and we all break the speeding rules to some degree. Some of us just don't get caught, but we, 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 all, we, all, we all do it. So imagine you're going up past the speed limit. You're going 75 in a 55-hour zone. By the way, that's, that's huge, 20 miles over. For those of you who've driven and you get caught, that's a huge fine. It's a big slap. You got to do driving school, all these things. And then imagine the officer comes to you and says, hey, you're 20 miles over. What did you just do? You broke the what? You broke the law. But then he's in a good mood. He's like, you know, I kind of, maybe I reached my quota or whatever. I don't know. Whatever happens in that transaction, he actually says, guess what? I'm going to let you off. What just happened? You were shown what? Yeah, you were not given that. You were exposed to, to, to the love and grace and mercy and all these things. But does that mean that the law doesn't apply because you were shown grace? No, no. You know grace because you didn't deserve what you were supposed to have. There's no such thing as grace if there's no standard. There's no such thing as mercy if there's no standard. You see, we all have a pardon that we don't inherit because of what Jesus did. Jesus paid that price that we don't have to pay, and it's because of what Jesus did. Romans 6.15 says, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law? This example? Certainly not. Just because we're under grace doesn't mean. Notice, God says it's like a mirror, this law. It tells us this um, in James 1, 23 to 25. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Did I miss something? And then it goes on. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Notice James calls the law of God the law of liberty. 
That's because you're not really free to go against God's law. There's no such thing as, as living as a Christian if you believe in murder, if you believe in theft, if you believe in adultery. All of these are sinful and those aren't looked over. Those will always be marks of sin. And God does not say, well, that's okay because you're under grace. These things don't change. Very, very important. It's the same thing with the Ten Commandments. I want us to look at the book of Psalm, because this is very telling truth. Psalm 19 verse 7 says this, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Isn't that interesting? He makes the wise things simple, like Jesus, like the coin, like the woman caught in adultery, we notice those words and we're like, oh, that's so simple. Or I would have said that. Or I could have done that. That's what wise people do. They make complicated things simple. That's who Jesus was, the beauty of it. There are only two kinds of people in this world. I love this example. I heard this many years ago. That there's pigs and sheep. Pigs and sheep. They both run down the hill. They both run in the field. They both get into a puddle of mud and they're dirty but the difference is the pig loves to roll and stay in it and the lamb says i'm getting out of here i don't like to be in this we've all sinned we've all fallen short of god's glory and this is established in the law that god has given to us it's important church to know the difference. Revelation 12, 17 says this, and the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. Who does the devil go after? He tried to kill Jesus and he did, but he didn't realize that that was actually his undoing. And when he didn't succeed in that, who did he start going to afterwards? The church, to you, to me, the offspring. And what better way than to say, you know what? Live how you want. Jesus died. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. He died. But yeah, that means you get to do whatever you want. Another lie. The lawless one. The son of perdition. Again, this is something that is nothing new that the devil continually does. These are the ones he makes war with those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith in Jesus Christ. This is the description of God's last people, the ones who stand on Mount Zion with the Father's name on their foreheads. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You know, there's so much that God wants us to know. There's so much that God wants us to understand. And there are people in this world who have suffered. There's people in this world who think, you know what, I want to live the way I want to live. And they come to a day and a time and they say, Lord, what was I doing with my life? I thought living in the fast lane or living in this way or, or doing this was, was fun. I thought it was great. And why didn't anyone tell me? Why didn't anyone tell me that, that living this way was actually not going to help me? Why didn't anyone tell me that this law of God actually applies and it helps me? And it actually gives life. It doesn't take life. It helps me to light the path to distinguish that's not something of God. Church, we have it before us. The law of God. And it's here not to save us, but to point to our need for a savior. And God doesn't want us to aim to this to save us. He wants to write it somewhere. Where does he want to write it? On our minds. On our hearts. And at the end, it's going to show. Not written on your forehead, but that's where you make the decisions. You see inside the armor of God in Ephesians 6, it says, the helmet, which covers the mind. It's the helmet of what? Salvation. Salvation. What is salvation? To know the truth of the gospel. We are sinners. We have broken the law of God. We are in need of a savior. We need to protect that part of our mind. That's why there's a helmet. 
We need to know what salvation means. We need to know what the gospel really is about. We need to know to protect the law that God's put in our minds, in our hearts. Scripture tells us above anything, guard your hearts for out of it comes the fullness of life. And God wants to put what in your heart? His law. Guard your heart. Guard your mind. And watch what God does. You look at this picture and you're like, wow, Jesus, you saved me. You saved me. You gave your life because of this sin, because of these broken laws, these broken promises, these broken things that are all around me. God, I don't want to live that way anymore. Jesus says this in his own words. If you love me, keep my commandments. So tonight, I invite you to think about what that means. Jesus in your heart. What do we mean by that? I want Jesus in my heart. Jesus, I want you to change my heart. The world will tell you there's nothing wrong with your heart. Do what you feel is right. Do what you think is right. Establish what you think is truth, what you think is truth. Your truth and my truth. The Bible calls that an opinion. That's not truth. There's only one truth, and that is Jesus. The way, the truth, and the life. And when he comes back, there's going to be only two. We're going to say, Lord, Lord. He's like, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a second. This isn't my words. This isn't Pastor Nate's words. Let me be clear. These are the words of Jesus. Jesus will say, depart from me, I don't know you. And what is the basis? You guys are lawless. That law is not in your mind, it's not in your heart. I've said, if you love me, keep my command. There's no distinction. Society says, I don't see a distinction between the church and inside. We don't know, lying, cheating, stealing. This is basic stuff. God wants to put that in your heart where it becomes natural to us. And so that's my invitation to you tonight. Lord, we want to invite you. Lord, invite you into our hearts. So I'd like to close today with a prayer. I'd like everyone to stand. We can have a word of prayer. Let us pray. Uh, Dear God, I want to thank you for the gift of Jesus, for the one who died, not just to show us how to live a humble life, a sacrificial life. Some would call this the the, the moral influence theory where Jesus died to model humility, model sacrifice. And there is a little bit of truth. He showed us the way. Some people said that he was trying strictly to fulfill this law that, that God killed him and God's a tyrant and God's evil and, and God would do anything to satisfy his hunger for blood and sacrifices and lambs and, and he needed this. No, there's no satisfaction for God. The lake of fire and the end was made for the devil and his angels and death itself. It was not made for humanity. It was not made for us. But Jesus took our place. Jesus was our substitute. Jesus took our place. Like a train going by, someone stuck there with their foot, couldn't get out, and the train is coming. Jesus came, pushed that person out of the way, and took his place. Some would say, who did he pay it for? He didn't pay anyone. He got in the way and took our place because he's the only one who could do it. Jesus, you stood in the way. You took our place in death. And that was because people don't know you anymore. Lord, we want to know you. I pray, Lord, 
that every person in this room and everyone who's watching online today would say, Lord, I know what it means by the phrase, I want Jesus into my heart. Now I know what it means. I want you to change my heart. Change it into godliness. Change it from this lawlessness and say, God, I can't keep this law. No one can. But in the saving grace of Jesus, Lord, you could transform my heart. This plan of salvation, this thing called sanctification, where each and every day we're growing in grace, we're growing and be transformed through the power of the Holy Spirit. Day by day, we are growing and learning into the image of God. If that is your prayer, I just invite you to raise your hand. Say, Lord, change my heart. Change my heart, Lord. I don't have what it takes to keep your law. No one can, but you can write it on my heart. You can write it on my mind and walk with me each step of the way. Those of you online, you just want to say, Lord, I want to invite you into my heart. Change my heart. Now we know what it means when the Bible says, I want to put my law on your heart and your mind. I want to make it so that it's pure and clean and holy. Lord, we are here. You may put your hands down. Lord, I just want to uplift to you your, your children. Because, Lord, we've been lied to from the beginning that there is no moral standard. We can live as we please. And that is the furthest thing from the truth, Lord. Lord, I pray that we would leave this place knowing that you're a God of love. And you want us to have your heart because you don't change. You love us. You're merciful. You're kind. But we don't have that. Change us, Lord, to be more like you so the world could finally say, yes, I know what a Christian is. Man, I love those Christians. Man, I love those followers of Jesus. They don't compromise goodness and grace and mercy. They don't cheat or steal. or this. I, I, I love to have a Christian as my friend. Lord, may we be those people. And if we're not, Lord, today we make that decision. Lead us, Lord. May we follow you faithfully. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to thank you all for coming tonight. And tomorrow we have a very, very good topic. Revelations, signs of God. You have a blessed evening. And see you tomorrow at 11. God bless you. Now?